The other thanes, the battle dodgers, the poet calls them, returned from the woods, ashamed and came behind shields. They're hiding behind their shields, even though the dragon is dead. And they find Wiglif shoulder to shoulder with their dead lord. Wiglif instantly rebukes them for their cowardice, which is made worse because of all the gifts Beowulf has given them. The lord of men who showered you with gifts and gave you the armor you were standing in was throwing weapons uselessly away. Because of their cowardice, these thanes will live in disgrace because of their failure to keep their vows to the king. Wiglif says, So it is goodbye now to all you know and love on your home ground, the open-handedness, the giving of war swords. Every one of you with freeholds of land, our whole nation, will be dispossessed. Once princes from beyond get tidings of how you turned and fled and disgraced yourselves, a warrior will sooner die than live a life of shame. The thanes' cowardice will encourage foreigners to invade, for Beowulf is dead and the other Yates are cowards. The momentary decision, the decision of a, of a second to abandon their lord and save themselves, has placed the entire nation and their future in danger. History and legend will not blame the dragon, but these thanes for the downfall of the Yates. Wiglaf then sends a messenger to the rest of Beowulf's army, who apparently has been waiting for news on a nearby ridge, according to what the poet says in lines 20, 2892 to 2897. The messenger reports Beowulf's death quickly and then gives a long forecast about the future. He predicts the awakening of old feuds with the Franks, the Frisians, and the Swedes, three different feuds awakening. The messenger recalls battles from the feud with the Swedes, reminding the thanes that the Yates killed the Swedish king, an act that has gone unavenged for many years. Now that Beowulf is dead, though, the messenger says, this bad blood between us and the Swedes, this vicious feud, I am convinced, is bound to revive. They will cross our borders and attack in force when they find out that Beowulf is dead. The poet confirms the accuracy of the messenger's prediction when he finishes by saying, he got little wrong in what he told and predicted. The messenger then says something very odd at the end of his speech. Though Beowulf intended his people to use the gold hoard well, the messenger says that Beowulf's funeral pyre will melt no small amount of gold. That pile of rings he paid for at the end with his own life will go up with the flame, be furled in fire. For some reason, the, the messenger is recommending that the Yates burn the gold and bury it with Beowulf. Why? It came at such great cost, so why destroy it? But there are two reasons for this. One is religious, theological, and we'll discuss it in the next video. The other reason is pragmatic. The messenger knows that the Yadish army is weak and inexperienced. Three old feuds will be awakened with three different people groups. If word gets out that Beowulf won a vast pile of gold before he died, several other people groups, besides the ones that have feuds to settle, would suddenly have a reason to attack the Yates. Like Thor and Oakenshield after Smaug is killed, the Yates find themselves the owners of a vast treasure that they cannot hope to defend. The only pragmatic solution for them seems to be to burn and bury it with their dead king. But burning the treasure is not only pragmatic. According to Germanic pagan tradition, burying a dead king with vast amounts of gold can bring a people a very significant advantage,